Okay, I think we can, might get started. So, uh, yeah, let's do that. Hello, my name is Maciej or Mac Przepura, uh, and I'm here today to talk about uh, Java Memory Model or JMM in, in short. Uh, so, one disclaimer at the beginning. What I'm going to talk about is very low level and you as Java developers are thankfully most of the time shielded from those nitty gritty details because of the one, uh, one point is the Java virtual machine that shields you from uh, the bare metal and then the standard Java library also shields you from many of the details I've, I'm going to talk about today. So, uh, well, it's not that you're going to use that knowledge in your everyday work. Uh, unless you're developing libraries or trying to squeeze the last drop of performance. Okay, so that's one disclaimer. Uh, and a few words about me. Uh, I'm working for Atlassian. Uh, I'm developing uh, Jira Cloud. Uh, I'm molecular biologist by my uh, uh, education, a software developer uh, uh, as my uh, occupation and home brewer uh, as a hobby. Uh, this QR code is for my LinkedIn, so if you want to talk about anything related to this talk or anything related to Atlassian, uh, you can use LinkedIn uh, to get in touch with me. And yeah, enough about me. Let's talk about the, the agenda of today's talk. So one thing that I'm going to focus on first is how modern computers work and why does it matter for you as a Java developer, right? Uh, Java is thought of as a high-level language that shields you from hardware and so on and so forth. Uh, you know the saying, right ones debug everywhere. So yeah, it actually matters how the modern computers work for you as a software developer. Then we'll talk about uh, the importance of a specific detail in uh, modern hardware, which is how cache coherence works in modern CPUs. Uh, I'm going to mention the MS Messy protocol but I won't delve into details about this one because it's very convoluted and it's just better to spend your time reading the actual uh, specification of the protocol and following it because it would take uh, another one hour to explain how it works. Uh, I will explain why volatile keyword is not enough in Java to have uh, the concurrency control that you need. Uh, and then I will explain the Java um, uh, memory model. Okay, so... Let's move on. How do modern computers work and why does it matter? The thing is that when you write software, when you write your program, the program is not necessarily executed in the exact order you have written it as a software developer. Let's say we have the simple program with four assignments. A equals three, B equals five, C equals eight, and D is A plus B, right? So what a naive uh, approach would be that when I execute that program, this is the exact order in which the instructions are executed, right? So one possible order is one uh, first, second, third, and fourth uh, instruction is executed. But that's not necessarily how computers work today. You can have those instructions reordered. And what is more, if you don't apply uh, correct syn synchronization in your uh, program, you might actually see this, uh, the effects of reordering instructions. So yeah, um, one thing is that you can have the, the order in which you have written your program, but you can also have a different order. For example, we can have instruction third executed first. So first we assign A to the C variable. Then we assign B uh, five, and then assign uh, three to A. And what is important is that uh, modern compilers do this, modern CPUs do this, but uh, in, at least in theory, you will still get uh, correct results. So you won't get the fourth instruction, which is adding A and B, executed before A and B is assigned. Right? Uh, that's what compilers uh, guarantee you. That's what uh, 
CPU pro, uh, guarantee you, but <sighs> there are bugs, right? Let's not get into that. Let's assume that this works as it should. It's just that for some reason, those instructions might be reordered. So what are the sources of reordering? Well, the first source of reordering in Java program, in a single threaded uh, program, might be the Java compiler. So the Java compiler might take your Java code and emit bytecodes uh, and optimize those bytecodes and then uh, reorder the assignments in your program or reorder the uh, execution order. So that's one source of uh, reordering. The other uh, source of reordering might be the just-in-time compiler, which takes your bytecodes and transforms them into uh, binary code used by your processor, right? The just-in-time compiler might, might introduce its own optimizations, which, because it's, it's basically a compiler that optimizes things, and it might change the order of execution in your program as well. Then, the CPU itself might take the uh, binary, binary code that the JIT compiler emitted, and it can fiddle with it as well and optimize it in its own way. So it can introduce its own uh, reordering. And then the CPU itself, once it performs a write from register to memory, it can actually reorder those writes. So even though your uh, instructions executed in the order you have written them, you won't see that in memory because the, uh, the CPU to cache writing might happen in a different order. So what Java Virtual Machine guarantees you that within a single thread, you still get the uh, as-if serial semantics, which means that uh, in a single threaded uh, environment, all those tricks that I mentioned before are hidden from you as a developer, from uh, you as a user, and have no e effects other than uh, speeding up the execution uh, the Java language uh, specification requires uh, the virtual machine to maintain this semantics, the as-if serial semantics. So as long as the program has the same result as if it were executed uh, in a strictly sequential order, all these changes or these optimizations are per permissible. So we can still uh, have different orders of execution, but the end result is going to be the same. Right? And the only uh, side effect of those uh, changes in the order will be sp sped up execution. Okay, so let's move on to IntelliJ. I want you to show you uh, some uh, software. That's a basic program. Take, a time, take your time to uh, read it, uh, to think about what is the actual uh, end result. This is the important thing. There are two stati uh, four static variables, x and y, a and b. All of them are initialized to zero, and then we have one thread that writes to a, and then assigns the value of b to x, and then the other one that writes to b, and then assigns the value of a to y. So what do you think? What are the possible uh, outputs from this program? We print x and y in the end. Okay, take your time, think about it, and if you have something in your mind, just uh, raise your hand. Yep? Well, I'm only interested in X and Y. Is it the only possible uh, uh, output? Yep, that's true. So let, let's let's look into that. Uh, so let's uh, let's see how it actually would uh, be executed. Let's assume, right for now, that it is a single processor machine that executes uh, this code. So we actually have threads interleaving uh, the execution, right? So this is one possible outcome. We assign uh, one to A, then we switch threads. 
and the thread, thread two starts executing, and then we assign one to B, then we assign the value of B to X, which is one, and then we assign the value of A to Y, which is one, so we both, uh, both X and Y are one, right? So that's, uh, that's one possible outcome. The other possible outcome is that, well, the thread two, for some reason, was scheduled to start first, and uh, as you probably know, thread scheduling is uh, on, on the Java virtual machine is more or less, uh, uh, how to put it, uh, it's non-deterministic. So you might have some switches that can affect how the threads are scheduled, but you cannot tell the virtual machine, start this thread before this one, unless you use some syn synchronization, right? So in this program, we have no way of controlling how the threads uh, are going to be started, which one is going to be started before the, the another one. So again, uh, let's get back to this uh, possible outcome. We first start thread two, which assigns B, uh, which assigns one to variable B, and then assigns the value of A to Y, which is zero, and the thread ends, right? And then, uh, the first thread starts, the one that was uh, uh, first, uh, first created. And then we assign 1 to A, and we assign the value of uh, B to X. So we get X equals 1, and Y equals 0, right? So that's another possible uh, uh, outcome. Another possible outcome is the uh, symmetric situation, when the first thread ends before the second one starts. And, well, we have the uh, symmetrical output, so x is 0 and y is 1. But there is one more thing. You mentioned that both x and y might be 0. Why is it so? Yeah, but on a single core. If you have both of those, uh, if you have a single core machine, can you have x and y equals 0? Yes, you can. Why is it so? Because you have the reordering. This is the first thing that I mentioned, right? So you can have the order of execution in, a th uh, in thread one changed by the compiler, by just-in-time compiler, by CPU uh, pipelining, by writes to cache, anything goes. But you can have the second instruction in the first thread executed first. So you can have this assignment which was second one, you can have it reordered to be the first one because, well, X and A, they don't, uh, they don't have anything in common, right? And you don't have a, any a synchronization here. So the compiler, the Java virtual machine, the uh, just-in-time compiler, well, they, they're free to rearrange your code. That's what I've mentioned uh, before. Also, uh, it is possible on, uh, uh, to have this, uh, uh, to have this uh, outcome on a, a multi-core machine for different reasons, because multiple processors are using the same memory, and we have the visibility problem that you can read from main memory, and then this data that you've read is stale. So you need to, uh, to be aware of that as well. So you might think, okay, so how can we fix this problem? How to, how to avoid this kind of issue? Uh, and a naive uh, approach is that we could uh, ensure that every processor knows what other processors are doing at all times. But this is very expensive because it means that we need to synchronize uh, caches, CPU registers, and main memory, and so on. And basically, that's not practically uh, achievable. Most of the time, what is more, most of the time this information is not needed because you don't need to know about everything that happens in your, uh, in your program, right? The processor doesn't need to know about all the changes to all the variables. Uh, processors uh, can relax their memory coherency guarantees so that they can improve the performance, avoid the uh, costly synchronization. Uh, and each processor uh, and each uh, operating system uh, has its own memory model 
that tells programs what guarantees they can expect from the memory system that you're using. And uh, there is this concept of special instructions, uh, CPU instructions, uh, to get the additional memory coordination. This is called uh, memory barriers or memory fences. Anyone programming in C or C++? No, just Java developers. Yeah, there is one C or C++ uh, developer. Okay, so in order to shield the Java developer from uh, differences between memory models across architectures, Java provides its own memory model. And the Java virtual machine deals with the differences between uh, the Java memory model and the underlying platform uh, memory model. And it does it by inserting memory barriers automatically. So think about it for a while, because it's, it's one, of, one of the wonders of Java. And I think that's the, uh, one of the reasons why Java became so popular. The bottom line is that uh, when you use uh, modern uh, shared memory multiprocessor architectures and when you use modern compilers, they can do uh, some surprising things with, when the data is shared across uh, threads, unless you th told them not to do this uh, through the use of these memory barriers, right? And Java programmers, uh, do not need to specify the placement of these barriers because they only need to identify when the shared state is being accessed and that's through the use of uh, synchronization. So either explicit logs or monitors. And it makes uh, multi-threaded development much more easy. Uh, and that's why I think uh, JVM or Java uh, as a language is was and is still is uh, so appealing to uh, software developers because it it simplifies the actual uh, model that you need to uh, use for developing multi-threaded programs. Okay, so this was the first part, uh, the reordering problem. Uh, let's move on. Let's talk about cache coherency. Why cache coherency is so important? So this is a typical uh, architecture of a computer system. So we've got a couple of CPUs. They've got their own caches. Then there are, there's actually two levels of caches. Then there is a, a shared third level cache. And this cache is, uh, uh, well, it's caching the data from the main memory where uh, bulk of the data for the uh, executing program is being executed. And also we have some hard disk that, and network card. And we have the data flowing through all these le levels, right? So we might le uh, load something from the hard disk uh, into the memory. Then we might want to operate on this data uh, in our processor. So it goes through caches and then it lands in the actual register for processing. Okay. And you probably know that uh, CPU, caches, and memory are all connected via bus. Uh, and we can use this fact for making caches coherent by, for example, uh, snooping on the bus, which is basically listening to what happens on the bus and replicating those changes. So that's how, on the very high level, cache coherency works. Uh, it's simplifying, but let's keep it that way. Uh, the important thing that, uh, is that caches aren't just dumb memory storage units. There is a, a, some sophistication uh, in how caches are being built. For example, it's not just containers for a uh, word, uh, a machine word or a byte. It's actually uh, lines of cache, which is depending on architecture, a couple of bytes or a couple of words. And Modern processors use uh, the so-called uh, messy protocol uh, or its uh, modifications. And the name messy comes from the fact that each line in the cache uh, can have one of four states or maybe even more. Uh, but the basic uh, messy protocol uses four states. Uh, first state is modified. And 
the cache line, this state means that the cache line is uh, present only in the current cache and it's dirty. So it has been modified from the value in main memory and the cache is required to write the data back to main memory at some time in the future before permitting any other read uh, of the no longer main memory state. The write back changes the line to the shared state. So we'll talk about shared in a moment. The other possible state, exclusive, means that the data has been modified and is in, has not been modified and uh, it's in sync with the data in main memory. No other sibling cache has this data, right? Shared, the data has been not been modified and is in sync with the data elsewhere. There are other sibling caches that may also have this same data. So we can have the same data in uh, processor one cache and in processor two cache. And then the final uh, invalid state, uh, this means that the data is uh, stale and no one should ever use it. It's, uh, it should be evicted. Okay, and messy protocol basically provides you with the guarantee that you can uh, enforce cache coherency by using those states uh, and by transitioning bet between those states. Uh, the important thing to note here is that uh, there are some trade-offs that you need to make when using MESI protocol, so that's why other pro uh, modifications uh, uh, are uh, uh, available and modern pro most modern processors, uh, like the processors from uh, five years ago or from, uh, from now, they don't use the original MESI protocol, they use their own modif uh, modifications. AMD has its own modification of this protocol, Intel has its own modification. Uh, you can read a lot about this on, on Wikipedia, so uh, I will share a link uh, to the uh, Wikipedia uh, article about that in the end of the talk. But yeah, the important thing is that you might, uh, uh, you might rely on caches being coherent. And that's what modern architectures guarantee for us. Okay, so let's talk about volatile keyword in Java because it has something to do uh, with uh, how caches work. Uh, so my question is, if caches are in sync through the messy protocol or through its modification, why do we need a volatile keyword in Java? Why do we need a memory model, right? If everything is in, uh, coherent in the cache, that should just work fine. Well, not really. Cache coherency is not enough because we've got another uh, side of the equation. Data is read into CPU registers and those CPU registers are not kept in uh, sync with uh, cache or, or main memory. And again, software compilers make all sorts of optimizations when it comes to loading data into registers or writing them back to the cache. And well, I've mentioned that before, also reordering of instructions. So these all changes are made uh, with an assumption that the code is single threaded, right? Because the, oh, why not? it's on the shoulders of the uh, programmer to actually uh, provide those uh, synchronization points. Uh, that's why any data that is at risk of uh, race condition needs to be manually protected through concurrency algorithms and constructs such as atomics and volatiles. So what is volatile? What is a volatile va uh, variable in Java? Do you use it? So, uh, who is using volatile? That's my first question. Well, a couple of persons. Okay. So, uh, a common misconception about volatile was that it forces writing and reading from the main memory. And that's not true. Uh, 
the volatile keyword only guarantees you that it force, uh, uh, forces visibility of writes to it to other threads as soon as it is changed. So basically, volatile means you cannot keep it in the CPU register, right? Once you change it, it all needs to be flushed down so that other threads, threads can read it. So that's why volatile is not enough, right? Because you need things like compare and swap. Uh, okay, so let's move on uh, to the Java uh, memory mo model. So what is Java memory model? This is a specification uh, in terms of uh, various actions, which is reads and writes to variables, uh, locking and unlocking uh, monitors, which are uh, locks uh, associated with objects, uh, and starting and joining threads. So uh, the Java memory model uh, defines uh, a partial ordering uh, called happens before on all actions within the program, and it tells what uh, what reorderings by CPU, uh, by uh, just-in-time compiler, by Java compiler, what reorderings are not possible. So what are the things that cannot be uh, changed? What, what are the orders that cannot be changed? You might wonder, what is partial ordering? So this is a mathematical uh, term. And we use it every day to express, uh, for example, things like preferences. So uh, someone might prefer pizza to spaghetti and rock music to pop music, but you wouldn't tell that you prefer pop music to spaghetti, right? This doesn't make any sense. So partial ordering help, tells us that if we have a, a set of uh, items, some of them can precede some other, and that's it. Okay, so moving on to uh, Java memory model and happens before. Uh, there are some rules uh, for uh, happens before uh, relation between uh, operations in the program. So the first rule is the program order rule in a single thread. So if we if we're looking uh, at the code in uh, in a single thread, each action in a thread happens before action in that thread that comes later in the program order. Right? Well, save for the reordering effects, right? Uh, so we can still do the reordering, but uh, for the uh, uh, external observer, this shouldn't make uh, uh, any difference. Okay. Monitor lock rule says that uh, uh, an unlock on a monitor uh, happens before every subsequent lock on that same monitor. So, uh, and it, uh, it, uh, it's actually applied both to uh, implicit locks, the ones that you use when you synchronize on some object, and to explicit locks available from Java Util concurrent. Okay, so if you have uh, two uh, operations, one is uh, unlocking uh, um, a lock and then locking it again, they happen before. Uh, they have a relation of happen, happens before. Okay. If you write to a vo volatile field, it has to happen before every subsequent read of that same field. And uh, atomic variables actually have the same semantics as volatile uh, variables. And then uh, thread start rule and thread termination rule. Uh, when you call thread start uh, method, uh, you will perceive this uh, action as uh, an action that happens before anything that happens in, in this thread. Makes sense, right? We, because it wouldn't make sense to see the effects of a running thread and having the thread not started yet, right? And the same is the, with the thread termination rule. So when a thread is terminated, everything that happened in that uh, thread 
has to be visible before you can actually tell that the threat is dead. Okay, and then uh, interruption rule. Uh, do you use interrupt? Interrupts on threads? I hope not. <laughs> But anyway, a thread calling interrupt on another thread uh, happens before the interrupted thread detects the interrupt. So you will see that uh, one thread called interrupt on another thread before this interrupt actually happens in, in the other thread. Okay, and uh, one more rule, finalizer rule. Uh, an end of a constructor for, a, for an object happens before the start of the finalizer of that object. Anyone using finalize method, overriding it? Oh, you must be doing some library work. Are you developing some library or no? Okay. But uh, anyway, uh, actually, do you know what a finalizer is? Uh, so let's explain it a bit. A finalizer is a method that is called after uh, the object is not more uh, not reachable anymore. So this is the last moment when you can run uh, any code before the uh, the object is uh, uh, purged from the memory. And it has to do with how the uh, uh, how the garbage collector works. So the garbage collector will invoke finalize on your object, the finalize method, before it actually releases the memory. And it was a source of uh, lots of very strange and hard to debug uh, issues with Java programs. So nowadays, I don't think anyone has any reason to use finalizer. Yeah? Actually, it's not deprecated. Yes, it is. It is. So you shouldn't use finalizer, but still, for the sake of uh, backwards compatibility, it is still there. It's deprecated, but it will never be removed, probably. And for the Java memory mode, yeah? Or to create uh, memory leaks, yes. <laughs> you can use it to create a memory leak. Yeah. Anyway, uh, uh, for the Java memory model, it is important that uh, you will see an object fully constructed before its finalizer is being called. So you cannot call a finalizer on, a, on an object that is just partially constructed. That's the guarantee that the Java memory model gives you. And then one more thing is that uh, the happens before relation is transitive. So it means that if A happened before B and B happened before C, it means that A happened before C, right? And one more thing, uh, one more constraint added is that uh, some of these actions or uh, all of the actions that I've told you before uh, are ordered with a partial order so you cannot compare some of them but you only can compare them in a single thread right so uh, some of them are actually comparable between different threads so you can have a total order between them uh, and those are log acquisitions and releases and reads and writes of volatile uh, variables. Those are totally ordered. Uh, this makes it sensible to describe, uh, describe the happens before relation in terms of subsequent log acquisitions and reads of volatile variables. So let's take a look. Uh, this illustrates uh, the happens before relation when two thre threads synchronize on a, a common log. If they had different logs, they would have nothing to do about each other, so there would be no uh, happens before relation between the two. Uh, all the actions within thread A are ordered by the program order rule, so, uh, so are the actions within the thread B. Uh, because A releases log M, and B subsequently acquires uh, this uh, log M, all the actions in A before releasing the log are ordered before the actions in the thread B, right? So this, having this common log, the, the M log, actually introduces some uh, before 
happens before relation between what happens in thread A and thread B, right? When the two threads synchronize on different logs, uh, there is no point of saying anything about the order of actions between them because there is no happens before uh, relation between the actions in those two threads. Okay, and the nice thing about Java uh, and the JDK, the standard library, is that uh, there are some uh, mm, some uh, provided already provided uh, uh, happens before relations that you can readily use. Like for example, uh, when you place an item in a thread safe collection, it happens before another thread retrieves that item from the collection. So you're getting synchronization for free by using a library uh, class, right? And there are other classes in the JDK that give you the same uh, uh, guarantees. My point here is that the Java Virtual Machine and the JDK uh, gives you abstractions, so you don't actually need to look into the Java memory model. You don't need to create those logs. Most of the time, you can use the tools that are already provided, batteries included, unless you're seeking for uh, either having some fun developing stuff, that's fine, that's one of the good reasons to do this, uh, if you want to learn about it, or if you want to squeeze the last drop of performance uh, from your program. If, because one thing that you can do is you can piggyback on those synchronization uh, effects. So you can use uh, one lock to synchronize a couple of things, not just one variable. But that's something that I haven't done myself. Uh, well, I don't remember when, uh, when, when, when was the time I last did that, something like that, because you don't need to do this. It's all in, in, in Java Virtual Machine and in J JDK. It's just that, uh, really, if you need to squeeze the, the last drop of performance, then you might want to take a look into that. Otherwise, it's already optimized for you by, by the, author, the authors of the JDK. So to sum it up, I believe that Java, uh, one of the greatness th great, greatest things about Java is that you as a software developer are already given proper tools to uh, develop uh, multi-threaded programs correctly. Just use the tools that are provided by the JDK uh, and remember about happens before rule and that's, that's pretty much it. Okay. So I've mentioned that uh, if you're interested into that, there are some things that you could read uh, to mm, learn more about it. Uh, for example, Java uh, language specification, Java virtual machine specification. Anyone willing to read it? Yeah, there are some people. No, actually I'm jo j joking. I mean, if you're really into this, that's something that you will probably end up uh, reading anyway. But the first thing, the first book that I would recommend is uh, Java Concurrency in Practice uh, by Brian Gutz. That's a really good piece of reading about uh, multi-threaded development in, in Java. And you might think that this book is dated because uh, it came around uh, the time Java 5 was published. But again, the core of the Java concurrency hasn't changed since Java 5. There are lots of additional tools that are being added in the standard library, but the Java memory model, the one that we are still using, was published with Java, A, uh, Java 5. So the book hasn't aged that much. It's just that there are some additional tools that you can use, but the concepts described there are still valid. Okay. If you want to read more about uh, the uh, MS MSI protocol, the, there is an introductory uh, article in the Wikipedia. So okay. if you're interested in nitty-gritty bare metal, uh, bare metal de details, I recommend reading that and then following the links. There are some white papers linked there and you can follow that. Okay, uh, one shameless plug. I'm from Atlassian. Atlassian is hiring in Poland for remote positions, so if you're interested, you can talk to me. You can go to our uh, jobs listing portal. Uh, 
This is the first QR code. And that's it. Thank you. <laughs> questions? Are there any questions? Okay. I see that you are uh, very tired. Well, it's one day of a conference, so uh, I understand uh, completely. If you have any questions, anything comes to your mind later, just find me on LinkedIn and I will be glad to discuss it. Thank you very much.